Jonah, while in the belly of a fish, cries out to God in both prayer and praise. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Out of the darkness, God heard my voice. You, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Charlie Bark, in the midst of crisis and desperation, called on God to heal him from the ravages of addiction and never looked back. This is a portrait of a life well lived. My name is Charlie Bark, and I was born and raised in western Pennsylvania down along the banks of the Allegheny River. I might start out with the fact that I was adopted as an infant, so that I have no knowledge of my biological background. And it's very interesting because I'm very interested in the genealogical uh, issues in my adopted family and uh, find it rather fascinating, but I have no idea what the biological family is. So now that I have uh, two children, two grandchildren, and six great-grandchildren, uh, there are some interesting uh, observations that could be made about that. My mother was infertile. She couldn't have children, but uh, after five years she did. As a child I was rather precocious. I got into my share of trouble. I, uh, I was blessed with awkwardness and uh, certain people in my life used to say that my father had a box of spare parts for Charlie because I was usually getting my my head cut or my eyes cut or something happened to me, but nothing ever serious. After some time of reflection, Charlie gave three words to describe his childhood. I, I, I think music and I think reading and um, I want to say church, but it, it was different than church church. It's not so much worship as the rest of the activities that were going on in church. The idea of religious experiences being more than just church would become a theme in Charlie's life as he began a career, married his sweetheart, and even as he fell into a pattern of alcohol abuse that would alter the course of his life. It was these early years of involvement in knowledge of church and the practice of prayer that would ultimately save him. Charlie pursued higher education close to home at Allegheny College. The student who dreamed of working outdoors began to pursue a career in the sciences instead. With no study skills, a precocious nature, and an engaging and trusting personality, it wasn't long before Charlie found himself in the dean's office. I really didn't have a goal in college. The first semester was Pinnacle, second semester it was Bridge, and then by my third semester I was majoring in fraternity because I had now graduated up to fraternity. At the end of the third semester, the dean called me in and said, Charlie, we don't know how we're going to get along without you around here, but we're going to give it a try for a while. Got a job in Buffalo, New York in a steel mill. Finally got hurt on the job. And it was enough of a life lesson that I realized that there are several ways to make a living. One of them is to work very, very hard at a miserable job. The other is to risk your neck, which I had done. And the third is to be smart enough to be able to do your job without working too hard and without risking too much. So I went back to school and I realized at that point that the only way I was going to get a BA was with BS. So I became the one and only philosophy major at Allegheny. Problem was that when I got out of college, there wasn't a real good market for philosophers. The choices were take a begging bowl and go out into the countryside, go back to college and get a useful degree, or join the military. And I immediately filled out papers for the Navy OCS I think when I really became independent was in the service. I was out of college. The parental 
paychecks had stopped, uh, I no longer had a cocoon and I had to go into the military. Charlie met his wife Alice while he was in the Navy Officer Candidate School, or OCS. Changes in military assignments were frequent, spontaneous, and highly stressful, with frequent ship deployments, ominous orders, and the lives of others in his hands. With a young family to support and the weight of responsibility resting on his shoulders, Charlie turned to alcohol as a stress reliever. Um, in college, I began to drink. It was not an issue. I wrote several major papers and studied for most of my exams in a bar downtown because for 50 cents you could get a hamburger and a 30 ounce schooner of beer. I got to partying in the fraternity and I realized something that when it was a drinking party, I never stopped till I got drunk. But I found that every weekend if I started drinking, I would drink until I was drunk. And that didn't really worry me, but I, when I look back at it, it was a pattern. And of course, the Navy kind of encouraged that. Well, that's when the wheels started coming off the wagon. Eventually, Charlie left the military and entered a market that had little use for navigators. I was very, very unhappy out of the Navy. I was lost. And uh, so I went out and I got drunk one day. And five years later, I was still drunk. I was a plateau drinker. Now by that, I mean what I would do is uh, when I woke up in the morning on my nightstand, there would be a bottle of beer. And I would chug the bottle of beer. And then I'd get up and brush my teeth and uh, have another beer for breakfast. And I was ready to face the day. Would get through the day. And normally it was a, f a high functional alcoholic. As long as I could get out at lunch break and get a couple of beers, I could make it through the day. Then when I got home, I would uh, get usually more beer. Uh, wine was much cheaper to get a buzz on, so I, uh, I did wine, that fortified wine. That was nasty stuff. Uh, when I could afford it, vodka, but I'd drink till I passed out. And when I passed out, when I woke up, I would have the beer. So my blood alcohol, I never had a hangover. My blood alcohol level was always high, but I was functional for that period of time through the day, or at least I thought I was. I finally lost my job at Sears uh, by bad behavior, and uh, then I was on unemployment, and there was just enough money coming in with Alice working at this point that I could get what I needed in alcohol. Alcohol becomes your god. There is nothing in the world that is as important as the next drink. Now, if you have the next drink and it's sitting in the refrigerator and you know where it's coming from, that's not an issue. Because uh, if you have that next drink, you're, you're fine. But if you don't, it, food doesn't matter. Sex doesn't matter, money doesn't matter, pride doesn't matter, family doesn't matter. Nothing matters but the next drink. Charlie arrived home to find a sheriff sitting outside. The sheriff ordered him to retrieve his belongings and leave. Alice was divorcing him. Panicked, he called his mother, explained that he was sick and needed a place to stay. Although his mother was scared, she allowed him to return to her home to recuperate. God was the last thing on Charlie's mind, but God, in his infinite wisdom, was ready to provide the resources and the strength Charlie needed to become free from his addiction and return to health. He just needed to ask. So I got an airplane ticket and I went out of New Bedford and I had a bottle of vodka with me. So I was able to enjoy the plane flight met a fella by the name of O.D. Weaver. He was a Christian. And I told him my story. And he said, you know, there's hope. 
there, you don't, don't give up. There is hope, but the, there's a light at the end of this tunnel, and I know God's going to save you. I know that your soul's been saved already, and you're going to be okay. Had to have help getting down the steps and across the apron into the airport. Had to crawl up the steps at my mother's house. Laid in bed, passed out. Woke up in the middle of the night, had to go to the bathroom. My legs didn't work. I swung out of the bed and fell in a heap on the floor. That my legs were absolutely paralyzed. There was no feeling in them, nothing. So I had to crawl over to the commode. And I finished there, got back into bed, and I just prayed as hard as I could. I remember asking God, I said, I don't want to be like this. I just don't want to be here anymore. Woke up the next morning, said hi to mom in the kitchen, said, I, uh, going up to see Don, the family doctor. I hadn't been eating for about six months, and I was uh, probably about six weeks from dying. My doctor took one look at me, gave me a B12 shot and a handful of tranquilizers and some high-powered iron pills and uh, said, go on home. Yeah, we'll take care of it, whatever you need. He said, uh, you just go home. I did. Took a couple tranquilizers, went to bed, woke up the next morning, felt better had no desire to drink whatsoever. I had lost the thirst. It absolutely lost it. I have no idea to this day what happened, but I didn't want to drink anymore. And I, I tell the story that it took about three days to get sober, get past the bad stuff, six days to really detoxify. And it took about six weeks to get my health back after I started eating again. It took about six months to get a job. Six years later, I was spiritually healthy enough that I got the call back into ministry. Charlie lived at home for about six months and began to reach out to Alice. At first, she was reluctant. But over time, visitations began to happen and love was rekindling. Eventually, Alice and their sons relocated to Ohio. While visiting Charlie's mom, the couple attended church and took communion together for the first time. In their minds, that was the beginning of their spiritual healing together, and they were soon remarried in a small Methodist church in Youngstown. Charlie and Alice engaged in Sunday school and Bible study, and the thought of entering seminary began to enter Charlie's mind. The problem? By the time he would be ordained, he would be 52 years old. But Charlie had learned by now not to question God's timing. What had happened is I was preparing for Sunday school, and uh, I was praying, and all of a sudden I had this conversation. I knew it had to be the Holy Spirit because I was at perfect peace, but it was a verbal I don't know what's coming through my ears or right in my head, but it was a verbal conversation. Charlie, it's time. Now, I didn't, I didn't question it, but I did question how on earth to tell Alice. I finally did. We were in the car one day, and the, the occasion came up and seemed right. And I said, what do you think, kind of, if we sell the car and go to seminary and I become a minister? She said, I wondered when you were going to get the word. But we went back to seminary. We didn't know where we were going to do ministry, but we kind of knew what. Charlie and Alice's life in service to God has taken them around the world. Charlie has served in three churches in New England and currently serves his local community in retirement at Gay Street United Methodist Church in Mount Vernon. He preaches on occasion, serves hot meals, and provides care to all. He freely shares his experience with alcohol and his life-changing encounter with Christ. The ravages of addiction cannot be ignored, and its consequences are lifelong. But with help and support from others, and a willingness to call on God in our moments of need, we can do all things through Christ, who gives us strength. 
After becoming sober, Charlie never had the desire to drink again. Come May 22nd, it'll be 40 years. It was in 1976 that this happened. One of the deals was that I don't drink anything. So I don't even drink Sacramento wine. One thing I would say, and this is not so much to the addict, but to those who live with an addict, you cannot change another person. When a woman marries a man, she thinks she'll change. She can change him, and she can't. But when a man marries a woman, he thinks she'll never change. She does. Change. We can't change anybody. But by God's grace, and with only with God's grace, we can change. We can change if, if we'll trust God and let down our barriers. And when you get to know God as Daddy, you understand how much this God loved you. Loved you enough to allow his own son to demonstrate that love. Not because he had to, but because he chose to. So there's nothing in this world that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing.